Does learning a new track feel like a pain and a chore to you? One of the toughest things about sim racing is learning new tracks you've never driven before, especially in simulators like iRacing which enforce a low down cockpit view, making it harder to see up ahead. Plenty of corners are visible and readable from far away, but an awful lot aren't, and having ways to visualise what's beyond your vision will make life so much easier. The visible racing line has helped vast numbers of sim racers get through the difficult first stages, don't feel bad if that includes you but if you're still using it, I know deep down you don't want to be. If you felt like you could turn it off, you would. If that sounds like you, this video is a must watch, and even if you're fairly experienced, these tips might help speed up your process. Let's have a look. Learning a new circuit is all about knowing the answers to these two questions. Which way is the next corner heading, and how fast should I be going? If you know the answer to those two questions, then you're already most of the way there, and there are clues on almost every circuit that help guide you. You don't have to just go out and memorise a track by pure brute force and repetition, that's the slow and painful way. I should know, it's how I used to learn in the early days before I knew how to read all the hints each track was dropping for me. We'll start with how to tell which way the track goes, and for that let's head to Monza, a place you might already be very familiar with, but it doesn't matter if you do, stay with me. This video is about interpreting the clues around a circuit that maybe you've never seen in this way before. Brake markers, or brake boards, have two incredibly useful jobs. The first and most obvious one is to indicate that you're coming up on a corner. They are your clear signal that a braking zone of some kind is up ahead. They're not on every corner, but you'll see them a lot. The other, not so obvious job they do, is they'll often indicate which way that corner will go. Take a look at these brake markers at Monza Turn 1, on the side of a track above the fence. They're placed on the left side on the approach to this corner because that's the side of the track that you are expected to be on as you head into it because turn one is a right hand turn. When you drive a racing line, you start on the opposite side of the track, then swoop across the track towards the corner. So this brake board placement is on purpose and is a brilliant and helpful clue, one that you can see from far away, long before you reach the corner. If they're not up high, then they're usually on the ground, but either way, they're often big and easy enough to spot. Whilst this guidance is not watertight, if you see brake boards, you should move over to that side of the track, ready to turn a corner that goes the opposite way. You can see the same going on at turn 3. The markers are on the right hand side this time, because the next turn goes left. You're expected to be on the right hand side of a track leading up to it, that's why they're placed on that side, closest to where you'll be. Although both of these examples actually lead into slow chicanes rather than single corners, it doesn't actually matter. You're still putting yourself on the correct side of a track to enter whatever comes next. The principle still stands. Slightly different for the next turn, there is a single, lone marker on the ground to the left as you head towards it. It's easy to miss and isn't all that helpful for gauging distance because it's so far back, but it is there and it's on the left side because that's where you're supposed to be for the upcoming right turn. Same again for the next corner. Markers are on the left, put your car on the left, ready for a right turn. Next is the Ascari Chicane and thanks to the crest leading up to it, you genuinely can't see which way this corner goes until you're right on it. So if you were learning Monza, then you'd appreciate a clue that a corner was coming up, which way it's going to go, and where you need to put your car. As you approach it, you can see these markers high on the right, so you should put your car onto the right side of the track, ready for an upcoming left turn. Although it's a sequence of three corners, if you place your car on the side of a track suggested by the boards, you will at least position yourself correctly to enter it and sort the rest out when you get there. So you get the idea. But wait just a minute, because on Monza's final turn, the markers are on both sides of the track. Why? I don't actually know. If you know the specific reason, then tell me in the comments. Either way, the result is that the brake boards alone won't help you position your car and you'll have to learn and commit this to memory yourself. Luckily, you should be able to work that out visually, that this is a right turn. Here's what I want to stress. Using marker boards like this to guide you is not perfect, but perfect is the enemy of good. Sometimes there'll be no markers at all, sometimes the boards are on both sides. On rare occasions, the boards are on the wrong side altogether, bizarrely. But if you head out onto a track with no prior knowledge of the track layout, 
following this rule will be a far bigger help than hindrance. At Monza, at least on iRacing's rendition of it, five out of the six corners have boards that conform to this rule, leaving only one corner that you need to memorise. That's a much lower mental load on you, leaving you able to focus more on just driving the track and skipping a large chunk of the memorization process. This is why experienced racers are faster at picking up new tracks, because shortcuts and tricks like this can chop the initial challenge down to a much more manageable size and give you a big head start over others. Some tracks use cones instead of boards for some corners, such as iRacing's rendition of Sebring. This applies to many corners there, but be it cones or boards, they serve a similar purpose. So test yourself. Take a look at this image. In this image, you can't even see the next corner. There's a wall blocking your vision of what's coming up next, but you can see the first brake board up above the wall. Which way is the next corner gonna go and what side of the track should you be on? If your answer is that the corner goes to the right, and you need to keep your car over on the left side as you head into it, you'd be correct. This is the last sector of the Magni Core circuit. Thanks to your awareness of brake boards, you can start to prepare for the next corner before you'd even know there was a corner if you relied on sight alone. If you wouldn't have been able to tell that just by looking at this image before watching this video, then great, you've learned something major already. Don't stop now. This guide is kindly supported by GT Omega. Their low-cost racing cockpits and stands cover you from beginner to advanced. You can use my 5% off code Danny Lee on their shops across all regions. Check them out after the video via the links in the description. Markers are one of the best indicators to use to forecast which way the track's going to go, but they're not the only way. Curbs are also very common features and their presence tells you a lot if you care to look. They're not placed on a track at random, they are usually put where cars are expected to be if they're following the correct line, which means that they are a good general indicator of where to position yourself as you drive those first few laps. So if curbs are usually found where you're expected to go, this means that if you're on a straight and suddenly some curbing appears on the left or right side of a track all of a sudden, there's probably a corner coming up and you're probably expected to be on the side where the curbing is as you run up to it. This guideline can be very helpful at world-class tracks like Silverstone, Spa, Hungaroring and so on because they're pretty generous and consistent with their curbing. So test the formula. Take a look at this shot where you can't see the track over the crest in front of you. There are marker boards on both sides of the track so they're not going to be helpful in telling you which way the next corner is going to go. But there is curbing on the left. So which way do you think the upcoming corner is going to go and which side of the track do you need to be on? If you said that the corner is going to go to the right and that you should move over to the left in preparation for it, then you'd be right. This is from the last sector of Red Bull Ring. So you see how just being aware of and interpreting the marker boards and curbs, you can learn new tracks far more rapidly because you're not just stuck on remembering where the track goes for as long and you can keep the flow going. If learning a track is a case of crawl, walk and then run, you'll spend way less time in the crawl phase now that you know this. So what about how fast you should be going? When you're learning a track, it's best to divide corners into two types to begin with. Those that need distinct braking and those that don't. In general, whenever you find the brake markers or distance boards, that indicates a distinct braking zone. Or at least that's how I interpret them when I'm learning a new circuit. And by distinct, I mean that you do need to consciously brake for it. It might only be a short, sharp jab with a single step down the gears or a long, sustained press. But these boards are, in my experience, mostly found at corners where you have to brake for them in some form or another. Pretty much all of Monza's corners require sharp or sustained braking to one degree or another, which goes hand in hand with why they all have distance markers to help you work out when to do it. However, go to a track like the Nürburgring GP circuit that has a few linked corners directly after the other that feed into each other. You'll see that the first corner in a section usually has distance markers, but the follow-on corners don't either because there's no distinct braking zone between turns or because you're not expected to need help forecasting the turn. At Nürburgring GP, turn one has marker boards as it needs you to slow down heavily for it, but turns two, three and four 
don't have marker boards, as they are essentially part of the same long sequence of turns that follow on from turn 1. Turn 3 definitely requires a distinct slowing down for it, yet has no markers, presumably as you won't have built up enough speed from turn 2 to really need it. Despite annoying exceptions such as that, the rule generally holds up more often than not. Corners that have distance markers usually require more pronounced slowing down than those that don't. Corners that don't have marker boards usually only need a backing off of a throttle or a smidge of brakes to curl the car in. I'm definitely keen to hear in the comments if you know of any corners that contradict this completely though, there are plenty of nasty corners that catch people out, and this is generally a more nebulous thing to pin down in a simple rule like this. But put simply, when you see these brake boards, you'll need to slow down and possibly a lot. When you don't see these brake boards, be ready in case you need to slow down. So now you have a method for predicting which way the corners go, and a method for predicting when and how much you'll need to brake for them, in a way. Dialing in how fast you need to go for every corner is the next step, and for that you can rely on your ears and your eyes. Gauging corner speed is harder to nail down because it relies more on your senses and judgement, so it's actually easier to highlight what you should never rely on. Not a single sim racer should be looking at the speedo to figure out how fast they're going in the lead up to a corner. The only thing that you should use as a speed reference is the gear you're in. The gear you're in is closely related to how fast you're going relative to the car's ability, and it's a lot easier to focus on that than it is to focus on your actual literal speed. The truth is that the vast majority of corners in the vast majority of cars are taken in second, third or fourth gear, which cuts down the complexity of learning a track even more. There are outliers that need first or fifth or sixth, this also doesn't really hold up if you're in a specialty car with 8 gears like in F1, but the point is that most of the time you're not having to memorise which of the 6 gears you need, Oftentimes, it's just 2, 3 or 4. In the early days, you might have to rely on being able to literally see what gear you're in, but as you pick up experience, you'll start to ignore the actual number and instead focus on how many downshifts you're doing and in turn, this will sink into the subconscious so that you don't really have to think about it anymore over time. This comes with experience and practice. Hopefully the earlier tips already covered can help free up your mind to think about this. Regardless of how efficiently you get there, your corner speed is defined by what gear the corner should be taken in. This can differ from car to car and even from setup to setup, and you'll still need to put some practice in to establish what gear you feel most comfortable in for certain corners. There is also a way to estimate and gauge the sharpness and length of a corner, and therefore judge how tight your racing line is just by looking at the curbing if it's there or not there. Red Bull Ring has a few examples of this. This is the approach to turn four, and as you slow down for it, you can see the curbing on the apex before the point at which you would turn in. This is a somewhat short, tight, second gear corner for most cars, and the fact that you can see curbing on the inside of the corner quite early indicates that. However, this is the approach to turn five, and as you slow down for it, you can't see the curb on the apex yet. That's because it's quite a long corner and you're expected to make quite a wide, sweeping line that slowly curls into the apex, meaning you have to be quite restrained on turning, otherwise you'll attack the corner too hard and apex too early. Remember the rule about curbs mostly being placed where you're predicted to be if you drive the correct line. That applies here. Turns 5 and 6 feature apex curbing that's much further into the corner because, done right, the line is much wider than it was in turn 4. The apex feels much later because it's a bigger corner. There's no curbing here because you're not expected to be hitting the apex here. You have to be more patient with your turning so that you can apex here. What this means is that the earlier you can see the apex curbing, the tighter, shorter and slower the corner generally tends to be. Combine all of these pointers together and take a look at Stowe Corner at Silverstone and imagine you've never driven here before. There are brake boards on both sides so they don't help you determine which way the corner goes, just that it's coming up. The presence of this curb helps settle that decision. The curb on the left means that the corner will go to the right. However, at the point of turning you can't see the apex curb, 
So you can assume that this is a long corner and you should be fairly smooth and slow with your steering to avoid attacking the corner too hard and apexing too early. The following corner has brake boards and kerbing on the right hand side only. So it's a safe bet to head over to the right ready to brake and because you can see the curbing very clearly as you brake, it's reasonable to think that it's a tight, aggressive corner for which you'll need to attack it as you see it, which it is. I can think of plenty of exceptions to this rule, but I still think it's worth having handy even if just to help associate and memorise the line you take for particular corners. In terms of how helpful these elements are, if brake boards are the cake and curbs are the icing, apex curbing distance is just the sprinkles on top. So these are the biggest and most helpful rules that I have settled upon to help navigate, memorise and refine my time on track when learning new circuits. They're not always watertight, some tracks are built different, some corners give you no such clues and some simulators and games may take liberties and mess around with the track furniture that these rules rely on. But I am confident that if you're hearing any of these for the first time, then they will lighten the mental load for you when you're next driving a new track. Hardcore sim racing is fun, but it's difficult at times. Hopefully this makes it more manageable for you and gets you on a flying lap much quicker so you can ditch the racing line. And thanks for watching. Leave a like and share if this helped you or if you think it will help anyone else. Subscribe for more stuff like this and let me know in the comments if you have any feedback. Cheers again.